yesterday I introduced this idea of phenomenological way of thinking. Way of, it's a way of thinking which is a way of seeing. Um, and I just put off the board a lot of things I've put up um, because I've left on the board <coughs> one thing only because that's what I'm going to focus on is the act of distinction. Um, I had up about seeing, about saying, an appearance which I'll come, come back to. Oh, I've left that up as well. <coughs> yes. <coughs> I had up before the movement back upstream from what is seen into the seeing of what is seen, from what is said into the saying of what is said. And I'm going to focus on the act of distinction we shall be a movement from what is distinguished, which is what we focused on, to what, what it is that is distinguished, into the act of distinguishing what is distinguished. And this will lead me into appearance. And so that will then be, the, we will discover this is fundamental, it doesn't matter which way you go it, you can go through seeing, through saying, distinguishing, whatever, you will, you will eventually come to this one, uh, which is appearances, going back upstream from what appears into the appearing of what appears, and that will turn out to be what is fundamental in all these cases, and that will also show us a very great deal, which at this moment is unexpected or unsuspected, and will lead us into the deeper meaning and significance of phenomenology. So now I'm going to rub these off, as I should probably at some point want to write something else on it. And um, I'm going to take this slowly because it is actually not easy, <coughs> but it's not difficult. It's different. <coughs> it's not like doing quantum electrodynamics. That is actually difficult. And you have to be clever to do it. Uh, this isn't difficult like that. And you don't have to be clever to do this work. As a matter of fact, no one should feel that they can't do this kind of thing. Everyone should have the confidence that they too can do this. Um, even if it's something which you're not accustomed to, or if you are more tending to entertain the idea, oh, I'm not that sort of person, oh, I can't do that kind of thing, others do that kind of thing. Anyway, I'm not interested in that kind of thing, I want to go and dig the earth and so on and that. Whatever you are, whoever you are, whatever your background, everyone should feel that they can do this kind of thing. Uh, and what, what inhibits us, what makes us think we can't, is a, is a set of assumptions we bring, presuppositions we bring from elsewhere as to what kind of activity this is. And it turns out it isn't that kind of activity at all. It's something else. So we should all be confident that we can do it, um, including me. Um, and I've, what I've done is I've, uh, I, in the book I've written, I've tried to do this as carefully as I can uh, so that as I mentioned yesterday, people reading the book will find the book itself, the reading itself, becomes an exercise in seeing. Uh, this is how it works. Um, it's meant to be done in that way. So I'm going to now look into the act of distinction. <coughs> and... Uh, 
I'll read s some bits of this because I, I've tried to get it as clearly as I can. Um, when we think of the act of distinction, we think of it in terms of the outcome. That is, in terms of what is distinguished. And when we think in this way, we cannot avoid thinking of distinction only, only in terms of difference. That is, that one thing is different from another. And the movement of thinking here is one which automatically, almost, turns distinction into separation. And so we come to think that distinction and separation are the same, but they are not. We can see they are not by trying to go upstream into the act of distinction, into the act of distinction itself which means going into the happening, the coming into being, which is the appearance of distinction. We could call this dynamical distinction the primary distinction, as opposed to the secondary distinction, which merely partitions, partitions and separates what has already been distinguished. <clears throat> when we go upstream and try to catch distinction in the act, we discover something fundamental, which we overlook when we begin downstream with what is distinguished. When we shift our attention into the happening, which is the appearing of distinction, we notice that distinction not only differences, but at the very same time, it also relates. It differences. Now, I'm using the word difference there in a, uh, in a verbal sense. Um, I don't have a problem with this, um, but some people do. If you're a student of 20th century philosophy, you get used to this kind of thing. Um, to get to the, the dynamics of things, or to get to what you're really trying to say, sometimes you have to make the language work in a way in which it's not natural for the language to work in ordinary English usage. A lot of people don't like this, and particularly, of course, a lot of publishers don't like this, because they don't want to publish books <coughs> in which you say something which appears to be ungrammatical. And in fact, uh, I, I always had a problem with this. I used to discuss it. And I, I've got a footnote on this which refers to the college here. Uh, so you might have the use of differences in a verbal manner may at first cause difficulty for some readers. And the same goes for differencing, which will also be used. A precedent for this may be the use of presences and presencing which is now commonplace in discussions of Heidegger's philosophy, although there are some who continue to find this objectionable. When I, my first book was being published, the publishers who did it <coughs> at that time was called Lindisfarne Press. It was then bought out and changed to Lindisfarne Books, which is a great pity, <coughs> because it's now no longer the publishing book that it was when I published the book there. And I rather like their attitude then, but now they've simply been taken over by something else. But they always said, they were very good to me, that I would always have the final say. But as well as editing the book themselves, they put it out to a professional editing firm, which was somewhere in Oklahoma. And this didn't go down too well. Although I do, I do one thing did go down well, I'll tell you a minute. But the, 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 uh, the editor who was doing it there deeply objected to this use of presences and presencing. And I said, well, it's very simple. It's just now common usage. Um, it's what Heidegger uses this. I said, I've got about 20, 20 books on my bookshelf, 
with the sin. And his answer was, who the hell is Heidegger anyway? <laughs> and he said, we go here by the Chicago rules. The American attitude. Uh, anyway, I got my way. Though in some places I had to do some rewriting um, because of the way the Americans also have a revolting habit of taking hyphens out between words. And it just looks so stupid on the page. And there was whole bits I had to rewrite to avoid that, which I must admit did annoy me. Anyway, I did owe him also a debt because he did a brilliant thing, which far outweighs all these <coughs> negativities on my part. He did something I had not thought of doing. Uh, it's a key feature of the book, is in certain parts of it, the difference between unity in multiplicity and multiplicity in unity. It's a, a theme which is some people pick up very quickly and other people don't really spot. But it's a key thing. And he put those in terms in inverted commas. He said, because he's, this, is, this is used in a very special way and this is really what you're trying to do. And so he put those terms in inverted commas. So they stand out and it draws the reader's attention to them. This certainly annoys some people, especially some English people, um, who don't like that kind of thing. Because they just say, oh, I've understood that, you know, I don't need to have it continually pointed out to me. But of course, I do. I say, well, I'm the writer and I do. I have to be keep re be reminded, because this calls me <coughs> to see differently. That little mark does something in the brain that says, now see differently. And so I owe that to, to the publishers. So I must add this great positivity in to counterbalance my negativity about other things. However, back to my very interesting footnote. Uh, normal language use, not start again. Normal language use often focuses more on the noun than the verb, the static instead of the dynamic. But when it is the latter, the dynamic, which needs to be emphasised, then it may be useful to introduce an unfamiliar and therefore at first awkward term which is more dynamic. I have noticed that although they may look more awkward on the printed page, these more dynamic terms are usually readily accepted when spoken. When spoken. When spoken. I, that's a language change I didn't mean to make. In fact, I often just use them as a matter of course, without comment. On one occasion when I did make a comment, Nigel Topping, a mature student on the Masters in Holistic Science programme at Schumacher College, pointed out that as we can go from dance to dancing, so we could just as easily go from difference to differencing. This may not satisfy the voice of the schoolmaster echoing in my ear, but I'm going to ignore that because the schoolmaster doesn't know about the needs of philosophical work. I really like that. <laughs> and I was so chuffed with that, I said to Nigel, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to mention it, I'm going to give you a footnote in my book. And he said, no you're not. And I said, yes I am, I promise. Ah. And once you've promised, a promise is a promise. We all have a duty to see to it that... A promise is a promise, because it's a performative thing. Uh, and so, uh, it's in there. <laughs> That's it. <laughs> That's it. <coughs> and there will be people <coughs> reading it will think, what on earth is he talking about? But that's what I'm talking about. It doesn't matter. If he ever reads it, he'll know. Okay. Well, there we are. So, that was that. That's the notion of differences. And I use differences a lot. And I use differencing a lot. And uh, tomorrow, later tomorrow, I don't know when it is, when we come on uh, to Goethe, Goethe's notion of the dynamic unity of nature, where we shall do this, but in a different context, the notion of differencing will become extremely important, absolutely central. It is when we focus only on the difference, as we do when our attention is focused on what is distinguished, the outcome instead of the act, that we confuse distinction with separation. 
Now I want to look into this a bit closely. It'll get easier later. Yeah, this next paragraph is a bit tricky for you. Um, we say that A, I just use things like A, B, X, not X. You're used to that kind of thing, rather than say actual things. A can stand for anything, B can stand for anything, X can stand for anything. We say that A is distinguished from B, or that X is distinguished from its surroundings, which thereby become the background against which X stands out as being X. We must remember here that we are describing the very act of distinction. And so we must not fall into the trap of thinking of A and B, or of X and its surroundings, as if they were already there as such. So that the distinction, in inverted commas, would amount to no more than separating what is already distinguished. In which case, we are already too late in our thinking to catch the distinction in the act. <coughs> if A is distinguished from B, or X from not X, then the very act of distinction which differences simultaneously relates. That is, if A is distinguished from B, it is thereby concomitantly related to B by the very act which distinguishes it. So if you're distinguishing A from B, you are thereby relating it to B in that very act of distinction. Since this relation is intrinsic to the distinction and not added afterwards, it is called an internal relation. It is as if the act of distinction goes in opposite directions simultaneously. Distinguishing is a dual movement of thinking which goes in opposite directions at once. In one direction it differences, whereas in the other direction it relates. So the act of distinction Differences relates. That's a forward slash. It differences relates. Not differences and relates. It Differences relates. It does not difference and relate because these, because in that, because this would be two movements differencing and relating. But there aren't two movements, there's one movement which is dual. There's one movement which goes in opposite directions simultaneously. And that's an important thing. I will build this up slowly. You don't, you don't get left hanging. What comes into being as a distinction is therefore a difference relation. And the act of distinction is a unitary act
which differences relates and I'll put that in a curly bracket because it's a unitary act it's one whole it's a unitary act which differences relates <coughs> it is, could also say it's a unitary act and I'll say this later on of Differencing relating. It's not a it's not so differencing and relating, because that would be two. It's one unitary act which simultaneously differences relates. If the relation which is intrinsic to the distinction is not noticed, then the distinction can only <coughs> turn into separation, which is what happens when our attention shifts from the distinguishing of what is distinguished to focus on what is distinguished. When this happens, so that distinction is thought of only in terms of separation. It seems that the act of distinction is just analytical. But when we follow the coming into being of distinction, we recognise that it must also be holistic. This is not something we would have expected to find. No one would ever have expected to find that the act of distinction was holistic. Everybody knows that when you distinguish something, that's analytical and separates things. In the act, it is not like that. Afterwards, it is like that. It's one, and it's because of the dynamics of experience, the direction from the act to the fact, from the act, from, uh, uh, yes, from, from, to focus on the what, etc. It is actually internally holistic, and that's why I write its differences relates and call it a unitary act. And you cannot actually have differencing without having relating. They're two sides of the same movement. And since so the, clearly the act is both analytical and holistic. So now at this point I think it may be helpful to find an image for this simultaneity of what seem to be opposites. That is, difference, relation, analytic, holistic. Because analytic, holistic... Is another one. If I'm saying, I'm not saying it's analytic and holistic. I'm saying it's analytic holistic. It's, <coughs> that's one thing. Um, because we're upstream. When you when you fall downstream, which you do very quickly, you think, you know, it's I see yes, it's it's analytic and it's also holistic. It's actually in the act, it's one thing going in two directions. And this is what makes it difficult for people because we have to draw back from what is distinguished, draw back from that into the distinguishing of what is distinguished. And in the distinguishing itself, we can see that this is unitary. It's a, it's a, it's a difference which relates. It's not a difference and a relation. Afterwards, as you go downstream, it seems to be a difference and a relation. But in the act itself, in the very coming into being, in the very appearing of the distinction, there, there is no such separation. Now, I want to give you an image that can help with this, perhaps. Uh, it might not. I, I usually have a picture of this somewhere. 
that I haven't today. Anyway, I'm, I used to be good at this. I can take some of this off now. I can take all this off now, can't I? tell what kind of day it was, but how well it worked out. <laughs> <laughs> well, here we are, our friend the duck rabbit. Now, this is important. This is the duck rabbit. It is not. Duck and rabbit. This is what I'm trying to get you to see. And you have you have to just see this. It's not duck and rabbit. It's duck rabbit. And it's simultaneously duck rabbit. Of course you see a duck or you see a rabbit. But when you see a duck, that's the whole figure. And when you see rabbits, that's the whole figure. It's not that there's two things there in the side by side. A figure which is partly duck and partly rabbit. Then you can say, oh, that's duck and rabbit. The whole figure is duck and the whole figure is rabbit. Both together simultaneously. So the duck rabbit is a kind of model here for us. By reflecting on it, you can see it's a template for thinking, as Bohm would have said. It's an auxiliary to help us. By reflecting on it, we can see how it is not a case of partly one and partly the other, which would be extensive, but one which is simultaneously both. One which is both at the very same time. And that kind of what we come to here, <coughs> and I'll be dealing with this <coughs> much more when we come to Goethe and the dynamic unity of nature, <coughs> is we develop a new way of thinking. It's a way of thinking, seeing. It's a phrase I think I want to use. I, I, I just hyphenate this one. Thinking, seeing. I want, when I talk about thinking, or I talk about seeing, I actually mean thinking, seeing, as what it's one, it's, a, it's an experience, it's a thinking which is a seeing, okay? Uh, uh, and so, this is what we develop through philosophical work, as a new way of thinking, seeing. Um, and, uh, again, in terms of the way people are talking, Continental philosophy makes perfectly good sense. So it's a new way of thinking, or if you prefer, a new way of seeing, which is intensive instead of extensive. Those words will be coming back again. The extensive would be if it was partly one and partly the other. That's extensive. Intensive is when it's simultaneously both. Each is the, each is the same one differently, I shall be coming to this. That's, that's intensive. Um, and so, it, this, although I don't normally mention that at this point, because um, this really comes up later, as I say, with the work of the one and the many in the dynamic unity of nature developed by Goethe, 
but in fact it's here already, so I might as well mention it. So I hope that that actually helps somewhat. Now, right. Now I'm going to give an, an example which I think is extraordinarily useful. Um, you have to find examples of things. It, I can think these things directly because um, that's what you do in philosophical work. You actually, although you, in English you say you think about something, this is not what you do. You think it. You don't think about it. You think distinction, not think about distinction. And by doing this, you can develop all of this. This is what was really was the basis of what they did in so called German idealism. Hegel, so these sort of people, but people that don't don't have that kind of ability. But this is what you do: you think it. But it, it's actually, and particularly for the Anglo-Saxon mind, and I'm English. I'm just lucky to be able to do that as well to some extent. Um, is that you try to find concrete cases that can function as practical instances from which you can learn. Um, and then you can work more in, imaginatively. And so it's very useful for us to do that. And so when you spot one, then you really think it's, it's a marvellous opportunity. And I was, years ago, I read Oliver Sacks' book, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat. I don't know if you know this book. Do you know of Oliver Sacks? Oh, good. He's well known, isn't he? Famous, and particularly in the States, although he's English, he's, he lived in the States for donkey's years, so he's well known. Good. And this crops up in there. And I thought, oh, yes, this is excellent. So here we go. The first sentence is key, actually, coming back to the first sentence afterwards. The happening of distinction is the appearing of what is distinguished. That happening of distinction is the appearing of what is distinguished. Now we, now we exemplify this. It is well known that when something is first distinguished, it soon appears to all who are able to see it. Whereas previously... It had not been seen by anyone, even though, once it has been distinguished, we feel it was there to be seen all along, and we are astonished that nobody actually did see it. The medical disorder of muscular dystrophy provides an illustration of this. Before the 1850s, when this disease was first described, that is, distinguished by Duchenne, and I should mention here, but I don't have to, but I will. I said first described, that is distinguished. I first got into the recognising the importance of distinction. So actually working on description in the 1960s. So what I'm doing this, some of this goes right back to 1964-65. When we were working on a way of trying to describe experience uh, in a direct way. Um, with, without introducing certain uh, notions of time and so on. So we could describe how experience appears if you can just do it in the present moment. This is a philosophical exercise. So I, uh, description was for me a practical activity and very difficult. Because you think when you describe something that you'll just look at what's there and you'll put it into words. And when you get to this level I'm talking about, it really isn't like that at all, because it isn't there. <laughs> Actually, then you find it's not there till I describe it. And that's, it. and that's when, you see, describing it distinguishes it and it appears. And so I've really been thinking, doing this today. For me, I'm going right back to 1963, 
64, 65. And for a long time we worked on description and saw how there was a great deal hidden in descriptions because people would say, oh, that's merely a description. What we want is an explanation. What people didn't say, no, the mystery was the description. That was the remarkable thing. Once you've got a description, you can invent explanations ten a penny. So that's just by the by. It's a, a sidebar. Do you still call it a sidebar on the computer? Mm -hmm. A sidebar. No. The medical disorder of muscular dystrophy provides an illustration of this. Before the 1850s, when this disease was first described by Duchenne, it had not, Duchenne, it had not been recognised by anyone. But once distinguished, what had not been seen before began to be widely recognised. And by the 1860s, many hundreds of cases had been seen and described. This prompted Charcot, Charcot taught Freud, this prompted Charcot to comment, how come that a disease so common, so widespread and so recognisable at a glance, a disease which has always existed, how come that it is only recognised now? Why did we need Monsieur Duchenne to open our eyes? Well, that's terrific. <coughs> because being able to recognise it depends on the primary act of distinguishing muscular dystrophy so that it stands out. What we later consider to have been in front of us all the time is invisible to us before it is distinguished. We could say that the act of distinction there's it. And that's exactly what happens. And that is really remarkable. And that's what I want to turn our attention, attention to. I'm now going to change direction slightly instead of going on uh, to the rest of that. I want to really focus on this. Um, This extraordinary thing, that something which must exist isn't there until it's distinguished. What is going on here? Because it's something really quite, quite, quite extraordinary. Um, what time is it? What, to 11? Um, too soon for coffee. I could, I could have, never mind. Oh, carry on. Put that there. I'll just... What will I do? Oh dear, where am I? What's that? Oh yes, that's where I am. Okay. Now. I'm doing things out of order here because I want to go uh, to this now. This statement which is made at the beginning of that paragraph which says, The happening of distinction is the appearing of what is distinguished. And that's what I now want to focus on. So, what I'm going to do is I'm shifting from the first thing I had on the board, the distinguishing, now to the appearing, because when something is distinguished in this primary dynamic sense, it actually appears. And oh, thank you. Thank you. That's good. So now I'm going to go from. What appears? Actually, into the appearing of what appears. And I get that in.
There's now muscular this what can I say muscular dysentery? Muscular <laughs> well, you know what I mean. MD <laughs> MD has now appeared. <coughs> and then it appears, it is seen, and it can easily be seen. In fact, Oliver Sachs goes on to give his own example of this, of the Tourette syndrome, which wasn't recognised. And how, once it was recognised, he was there when this was recognised, and suddenly he, he said, you could see someone on a street corner in New York, you could see that, that was Tourette's, and had known before and seen this, because now it was recognised and so on and that. Now it appears, yet it was always, you see, you can't say it was always there. <laughs> That's the trouble. You think it's when it was always there, but no, it wasn't. It was only there in being distinguished. It don't, that's, it's, it's only there in appearing. So that doesn't mean it came out of nothing. And suddenly this disease hadn't existed at all, and suddenly it existed. No, it's nonsense. Of course it existed. But it hadn't appeared. And therefore it wasn't there. And this is the most extraordinary. There's something here so remarkable, so fundamental, it will take us a long way. But we have to go slowly. Because this, in fact, is really what is at the core of phenomenology. Um, and I can best do that. This often, I think people often don't quite realise this. The first phase of phenomenology, you, you would consider seeing particularly or something. <coughs> but you don't realise that that's only the first step. As I said, all these things turn out to be instances of appearing. Um, and this brings us to what phenomenology is really about. Because this is the fundamental phenomenological step from what appears to the appearing of what appears. Of course... It's important to recognise that it's the appearing of what appears. It's not the appearing. You haven't separated the appearing from what appears. That you can't do. You can't have appearing without something appearing, can you? It's nonsense. But at the same time, you can't actually have something that appears with, without it appearing. But normally, we do, it's the other thing that bothers us, because we do separate it. And we could we try to talk about appearing without thinking about well there has to be something that appears. This directionality is intrinsic to experience. It's the, it, it's it's not something added on. It's it's like with, with consciousness they got into the problem that they thought well you had consciousness and then you added something onto it that it was connected to something. No, the connection is already there in the consciousness because that is consciousness that directionality. Anyway, we're not going to use the word consciousness, though I just have done. That's silly, isn't it? Silly of me. Uh, here's a quotation from, uh, from Richard Palmer, whom I mentioned yesterday, his book, first readable book on hermeneutics. But anyway, this is it. When we speak of what appears, we refer not only to a thing, but to a happening, the appearing itself. And that's, I, mean, I, that, I read that in 1973, and that is actually, that encapsulates the whole thing. Because when we normally speak of what appears, what do we think of? We think of a thing that appears. We don't think about the happening, the appearing itself. We don't do that. <coughs> there is no appearing without something that appears, but we can shift the focus of attention within experience. And that's what phenomenology is all about. It is not introspection. There are books, particularly in early days, where they said that. And there are people today who don't know about phenomenology and don't want to, who insist on saying it's a form of introspection. The people at the scientific and medical network are particularly bad on that. Um, one of their people who writes in there is always saying that um, phenomenology is a, a form of introspection which is mysterious and makes no sense to anybody else because he doesn't know anything about it and he's prejudiced. It is not a form of introspection. It, an introspection would attempt 
to turn seeing into something interesting. If you were to enter into this introspectively, you would try to turn seeing into what you were seeing, which is, is nonsense. It's a shift of attention within experience from the outcome into the happening which results in the outcome. Now this statement, uh, the next one, is, um, is in Husserl's lecture called The Idea of Phenomenology, which is in, given in 1907. Now, if you turn to that, you don't want to do that. You don't want to do that. Husserl, you don't want the shock of turning to Husserl. I mean, Husserl wrote in a way in which you would think today he could not possibly have ever expected anybody to understand a word of what he said. Of course, in his own day, because he was working in a context, the people in that context could understand him. And indeed, it's an extraordinary thing that they found what he was doing so remarkable, word got out. And people came from all over Europe to hear Husserl. Because in German universities you could do that, you know. They had this thing literally with people sitting in the aisles, sitting on windowsills and so on and that. You didn't have to have so many people in a course like we have here. There are 20 people in this course and the course is closed. Uh, you, if you were in that university, you, you could go to the lectures. And Husserl, although he was in a way uh, a somewhat dull speaker, people picked up the fact he was doing something extraordinary. Um, now, if you turn to his writings from that period today, you, you would get such a shock. Because you wouldn't see anything extraordinary about them at all. In fact, I'm not, this is not meant to, to, to be negative. You wouldn't understand them. Um, I don't. They're very, very difficult. It takes an awful lot of work to get to know how to read those things. But buried in them, there are uh, they really affected people who realised this was a way of seeing. He had a lot of followers. And they realised this was a way of seeing and it could go in many different directions. And it, it fired people up. It was a real revolution in philosophy. It's the unnoticed revolution of the 20th century, which date-wise, his first work was called Logical Investigations, two volumes, not at all what you'd think of as phenomenology. And in fact, that's the same date as Planck's early quantum theory, which also... Planck didn't actually do what people now say he did, but never mind about that. Uh, so here we are, 1907. Is it raining? Mm. The word phenomenon is ambivalent because of the essential correlation between appearance and the appearing. According to this notion, <coughs> here's the key bit, according to this notion, a phenomenon is not only something which appears, but something which appears as appearing. It's utterly brilliant. It encapsulates the whole thing. It appears, it appears as appearing. It doesn't just appear, but it appears as appearing. There's the shock of appearing. Uh, and that's extraordinary because that sets it all up. Uh, says it all, and I have noticed that in recent years people have started to quote this more. I mean, I didn't find this until fairly recently, it, it got lost. And there it is 1907. So, I mean, another quote which is the same thing David Wood, uh, who used to be at Warwick, is now in America, who wrote a book on eco phenomenology. He says quite simply, phenomenology concerns itself with what appears in its appearing. Now that was 1980 something or other, 1990s something, wrote that. And I wrote that, I thought, oh, that's a really clear statement. But well, Husserl had said exactly that in 1907. Uh, I think until fairly recently, most people hadn't noticed. I hadn't, I actually had those lectures. Um, I got a second-hand copy, which was written all over, um, and it, it, the pages and loops were falling out and everything. Right? And I never really read it. So then I turned, I turned up and there it is. But it, it's in a page where, you know, really, it almost would not stand out on that page. 
it's interesting, but it's just so phenomenology concerns itself with what appears in its appearing. And the key thing, a phenomenon is not only something which appears. You see, a phenomenon is something which appears. He's not saying a phenomenon isn't something. No, it is something which appears. But not only that, it is something which appears as appearing. And this doesn't get understood. So when people talk about phenomenon, they talk about something that appears. They don't talk about something which appears as appearing. So the, what phenomenology is about doesn't get understood because if you focus on what appears, and you can do, that's downstream. Phenomenology is all upstream. Um, and so I think those statements are... And these seem to me to be very clearly illustrated by the... Um, <coughs> But I've just said about muscular dystrophy, this appearing. And in that moment, you catch the appearing of what appears. At that moment, it appears as appearing. And the appearing is what really interests us. And that, now, I'm going to go further with this now. Um, but I've got an idea. I think what I'll do... It's some. Um, what time do you make it? Five to eleven. Yeah, mm -hmm. eleven. Mm -hmm. Nearly eleven. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, I think. Uh, bottom page. Okay. I think um, I'll let that settle with you for a moment. Uh, a bit more to do, not much, yet a bit more to do. I think, uh, no, I won't. No, I won't, so we'll carry on. We'll, we'll, we'll do this. We're nearly there. So, as I said, uh, this is the phenomenon. It, it's the appearing of what appears. And so, what you get is a shift. Uh, from See, the word appearance is has a double meaning. It can mean what appears. It can mean the look of it, how it appears. But it can also mean appearance, the appearing. And that also summarises very clearly uh, what, what phenomenology is. And you have to make that shift. It's not merely the appearance. It's the appearance. You have make that shift from one to the other. So, for phenomenology, <coughs> the phenomenon is the appearing of what appears. It's not what appears. Uh, and that's the key thing. It's the appearing of what appears. Now, uh, this is what Heidegger later calls the ontological difference. And people puzzled about what on earth Heidegger meant by the ontological difference. This is it. It's as simple as that. But you have to get concrete examples to help you, I think, to actually bring it out. Um, now, clearly, if that's the case, the appearance, the appearing, the happening of the appearing... The appearing of what appears is a manifestation of the thing itself. It actually is there. It's not a representation of it. It's direct. Because it's appearing. If it appears, it must be the thing itself. 
And that's an astonishing thing, which where phenomenology takes you right away from the representational picture, which says all, all we have is, is the representation of things, we can't have things themselves. No, we can have things themselves. They appear directly. And they may appear under certain circumstances, they may appear in a certain perspective, things don't appear necessarily totally, completely, the appearance may be incomplete, uh, there may be more to come, there may be different ways of appearing, all of this, but it is nevertheless the thing itself appearing, not something subjective, uh, which is just to be subjective in the subjective sense of locked up in our, in our consciousness. This is why we don't like the word consciousness in phenomenology, because it's associated with the idea there's a kind of box called consciousness that has things in it. No, it's not like that at all. So con what happens in phenomenology is the word consciousness just, just drops out of use. Not for the same reason that it did in American behaviorism. Watson and so on and that in the 1920s. Where they said we're not we're going to deny that all that exists and just describe things as automata behaving as it were. Not for that reason, for the very opposite reason. Where we've gone beyond consciousness so we no longer need it. To the appearing itself. So that's extraordinary, really. And you can't say that about the appearance. That's the trick. Uh, it's wonderful. If you focus on the appearance, then the appearance, you can't say it is the thing itself. It, it might seem to be or it might not be. Or it might be something simply that you yourself um, have formed. But if you experience it as appearing, then it must be the thing itself. It's astonishing. This is the great step forward that was taken in the 20th century, which just hasn't been noticed. Which leads straight to a quite remarkable uh, quotation uh, from Heidegger, <coughs> which uh, <coughs> is this. Because I've said the thing itself appears. <coughs> 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 then Heidegger puts it this way being means appearing appearing is not something subsequent that sometimes happens to being being presences as appearing it's very astonishing what's in there and so easily misunderstood because you have to go into the appearing. I'll read it out again. Mm -hmm. Being means appearing. See, that's what I've actually just said now. Like I say, well, the appearance, the appearing, is the thing itself. So, I'm turning that around now, and he's saying, well, the thing itself is appearing. Being is appearing. So, appearing is not something subsequent that sometimes happens to being. What? we always imagine was, well, there's being, and it might appear or it might not, or we might see it or we might not, whatever. So they're separate. And throughout the philosophical tradition, being and appearing have been separated. And in fact, what we now discover is that no, when you understand, make the move upstream into the appearing, from the appearance into the appearance, then in fact, that appearance is being. It's, it's the thing itself. So it's, it's, it's not that there's being hanging around there and, or subsequently it appears. Um, being presences as appearing. And this does cause some difficulty because people say, well, things must have been there. Well, they are there, of course. But, and it's very difficult to know how to describe it. You could simply say, well, sort of things exist, but they haven't appeared. And they don't be until they appear. And clearly, for appearing, they need us. So we are intimately involved in the being of things, but non-subjectively. Well, it is subjective, but not subjectively subjective. Not the way we think of subjective. Something which just happens in a box in our head called consciousness. Far from that. <coughs> so that's, <coughs> I think, something really... Uh, quite astonishing because what that means is uh, 
uh, I must emphasize, of course, you only understand what Heidegger says if you go upstream from appearance to appearance. But what it means is there's nothing behind the appearances. But there is a depth in the appearances. And that depth is the appearing. It's astonishing. There's a depth in the appearance, which is the appearance. The happening of appearing is the depth in appearance. If you start from the appearance, then the depth in that is the appearing of the appearance. So there is a depth in the world, which is the being, where being is now hyphenated, the being not an entity, there's not an entity behind a, be a being which then appears. Being is appearing, it's now verbal. And in many languages there is a verbal form of being and a nominal noun form of being. In Fre German, in French, in classical Greek, in Latin. In English there's only one word. It's a duck rabbit, it's a reversing cube. It can be being as a being or being the to be, which is the verbal. We have to use one word for both. We can use this to our advantage. Um, although some people think it's a disadvantage. And it has been a disadvantage philosophically <coughs> because people trying to translate people like Heidegger, for example, have got completely muddled up uh, about this. So I haven't noticed that what he's talking about is the being upstream. And once you get it, it's not very difficult to see it then. So, this is the dynamic depth of the, of the coming into being. Is itself the dynamic. What this means is there's no metaphysics. Traditional metaphysics separated appearance and being behind it. Think of traditional Platonism. The world of appearance and the world of being behind. Actually, I don't think for a moment Plato meant that, and I won't get into this now, but it's been also realised that this is actually now called pseudo-Platonism. In other words, the standard established interpretation of Plato is pseudo-Platonism. It's what Gardamer calls vulgar Platonism. And I could, won't do this now, but you can see how Plato, as Gardamer said once, uh, Plato was no Platonist. Uh, he, he, spent, uh, he spent, when he started reading Plato, I think when he was about 18, and he continued reading Plato through until the day he died when he was 102. So I tend to think he possibly knew what he was talking about. If he didn't, nobody else does. So, I mean, you know, so, and uh, well, there's no hope for, what hope for the rest of us. Um, so I, I just want to say that although traditional metaphysics, therefore, it does that, and it's always associated with Plato, it is very likely that Plato didn't think in that way. But what that means is that the appearance got separated from being, or being got separated from the appearance. So you then have to find what was hidden behind the appearances and you get what's called the two-world ontology. And what this is showing us phenomenologically is there is not a two-world ontology. But on the other hand, it's not just reduced to a, a flatland. There is a depth. But the direct the depth is the appearing itself, which is dynamic. So, it's a bloody miracle. The world is actually totally dynamic. And can't be understood in any other way. Because once you focus on the appearance downstream, then you separate the two. It's a static picture. And then you've got all those problems. How do I go beyond the appearances to find true being? You're, you're going down the wrong way altogether. So this is a very remarkable step. And it does bring in the question of how we are, how, how we are with this. Because clearly it does depend on us. And I think I found here recently that the McGilchrist was very sensitive to this. He, he's very... Oh, God, where am I? No, it's not there. It's here. He's very sensitive to this kind of thing. And... Uh, oh. We've got some quotes. I can't read the damn quotes. I can't find them, can I? Um, they're here. Look, calm down. There you are. Calm down, and there they are. <laughs> now, he has it this way. Turn it 
133. One way of putting this is to say that we neither discover an objective reality nor invent a subjective reality. But, this is what I want, there is a process of responsive evocation. The world calling forth something in me that in turn calls forth something in the world. <coughs> and I like to put it this way. And I, I put it, I've written it out in a rather more clumsy way than he does, um, but I think it brings it out. There is a process of responsive evocation which is reciprocal. Something in the world calls forth something in me which in turn calls forth that in the world which called it forth in me. By completing it in that way, I think it says the whole thing. And so that's how I do it. I'll repeat that. A process of responsive evocation which is reciprocal. Here we go. Something in the world calls forth something in me which in turn calls forth that in the world which calls it forth in me. It appears. That is appearing. And that describes Duchenne's discovery I think quite beautifully. I think now that is the point I wanted to get to. There's a little more to do, but now it's perfect. Now, now I'm happy. Now we can stop and have coffee. Okay. Yeah.